Let's define archives first. And I, there's two different ways to look at it. The most technical way to look at it is archives are the permanently valuable records of an institution or organization. In other words, they aren't the personal papers of an individual. They are institutional by definition. That's the narrowest way to look at it. The other way is to use it generically as anything that has long-term value uh, and can be used in the future to make understanding of today. Um, and so it depends on which of those definitions you use. It is a site for knowledge workers to use, but archivists are looking at trying to determine what to save and what to throw away, especially of institutional records. You tend to save all of a person's personal papers, but if you're working with a big institution, you always have to make choices. You can't save everything. It's just not possible. And so you try to make it a a site where other people can produce the knowledge, but the archivists don't do that except by the selection that the archivists make. So it is a site where knowledge can be produced, but the archivists aren't, in, except in a very general sense, the knowledge producers. Um, archives come in every format you can imagine. We think of paper, we think of now electronic records, of course, but photographs and motion pictures and, and maps and aerial photography and satellite imagery, all of that is possible um, as something that might be saved. When you decide then what to save and what to throw away, a critical part of the archivist's job, you're first looking at evidence. What records provide evidence of what this institution did, what its authorities were, what it knew when it made choices, and how those choices played out over time. Um, you also then look at things like, what do I need to do to make sure that the human rights of the individuals whose lives are affected by the institution that we capture that kind of material. For example, personnel records. Mm -hmm. You need to keep those because you need, as long as the person is alive, to know that you can pay their pensions. You can take care of catastrophic illness, that sort of thing. Whether those have to be kept for the next 200 years is a different question, but as long as they're alive, you have to. So the first issue is evidence. Mm -hmm. Then you step back and say, okay, I've got all the evidence I really need of what this institution did. Now, is there other information that's in these records that would be really useful for someone to have? It isn't necessary to provide evidence of what the institution did. Let me give you an example. Um, in the United States, our Constitution requires us to take a census of the population every 10 years. And the U.S. National Archives has saved all of the census returns. Now, we wouldn't need to do that just to show that the census was taken, that the House of Representatives was redistricted, that a report was written. We could have done that in many ways. But all of the records are saved because they provide information that's irreplaceable about the population. Um, on the other hand, let me use police archives. You typically don't save them because you want to, let's use Colombia, uh, you want to know the biography of Pablo Escobar. It may indeed be in the records. What you want to know is what were the police doing when they were tracking Pablo Escobar? What's the evidence of what they did in this situation under what authority. So in one case, we're saving it for evidence. In the other case, we're saving it because it contains crucial information that's irreplaceable about people, places, phenomena, 
weather reporting, for example, um, uh, is often saved. Yeah. Not because we have to know that a weather station was operating, but because the historical value of the information about the weather is scientifically important. Yes, of course they can. Um, let's again, let, let me use Guatemala, where I've done a lot of work. Um, the way the police looked at the um, work that they were doing in Guatemala City during the harshest years of the repression, they were seeing it in one light. If you look at NGO records who were trying to help the uh, population in the cities, who were trying to help the unionists, who were trying to help student groups, people who were trying to help um, uh, the uh, indigenous population, that all is a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so it is up to the knowledge worker to piece that together. But every uh, country needs to make sure that it saves its official records of its government, but also the records of its businesses, its faith-based organizations, its NGOs, and personal papers, because they all provide a different kind of evidence that can be pieced together then and make a fuller and richer understanding of the past. It does not mean that everybody's going to agree what that understanding of the past is, yes. uh, but it does provide the option of having those diverse viewpoints heard in the record. Um, one of the big issues today, I think, is business records. And we have to find better ways of ensuring that we capture the records and preserve them and make them available for study of the big multinational corporations that in many ways have more power in some countries than the country's government. And we can't afford not to do that. Sure, absolutely, because uh, every archives is going to make decisions about what to save and what to throw away. And I certainly will make one kind of judgment about what I think is important, and other people will make a different kind of judgment. You have to hope that everybody is looking at the same issues of evidence and information and take into account the human rights element in the contemporary record. Um, but yes, we see people who have thrown away things that later they would, they would like to have uh, back, if you would. And uh, those stories are significant and we need to tell them. Um, archivists need to do a better job of explaining how they made those decisions and what to throw away. Let me give you an example. I was on a task force that worked under court order to decide what records of the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation to save and what to throw away. And highly controversial, as I said, it was a lawsuit, we were under court order. And we produced massive documentation on what decision making we had going forward as we looked at that. Um, you see others, though, and you pick it up, and there's one piece of paper, and it says, you know, we think we should save this, and we should throw this away. And you say, but why? Well, where's the rationale? You've got to be able to explain what you're thinking and why it made a difference and why you threw it out. The other thing that's happening today, of course, is there is a real impulse to save everything, because they say, well, it's just electronic and you can just keep buying more space in the cloud and there's no problem. But then you're overwhelming your researcher with junk because a lot of records in most institutions are indeed truly not worth preserving. Think of all the times that people buy uh, printer cartridges and toner and paper. Um, think of all the travel vouchers that people turn in. And, you know, there's no point in saving that. So even if it's electronic, you do have to make, make decisions. 
they can be slightly different than decisions uh, when it was paper-based because the electronic version of something, let's say it's um, how many imports are coming into a country and it's how much um, ammunition, weaponry is imported. Well, it, if it was all paper, going through those stacks and stacks would have been a lifetime operation. Now, now that it's probably just data in a database, all the kinds of research that can be done with that changes the decision on whether you're going to save every entry of ammunition into the country or weapons into a country as opposed to when it was all in paper. So it changes depending upon the format. Um, satellite photography now is terribly important. We've got to figure out uh, good ways to save that and make it available because um, we now know it can be used in human rights cases. Uh, you can see overflights of burned villages. You can see oversights of uh, disruption of the earth where possible mass graves are. Mm -hmm. And all of that has been used now in court cases. And so again, we've got to think hard about how much of this overflight do we save to make sure that we don't miss what is needed for evidence. I think the best way is to have more people in the discussion. Mm -hmm. I have made a lot of individual decisions on what to save and what to toss, but they're never going to be as good as if I have to justify it to another uh, two or three people and we have to argue about it. Um, and so if you can get more people into the decision making, and I'm not talking about um, one little set of files, but in the general parameter of is this what we're going to concentrate on, is this what we're going to do, um, then you've got a better chance of making sure that somebody's going to say, ah, but wait, wait, and that will help us.